Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. So what I want to do now to lead this segment is go through all of the winners and losers from the draft deadline, the players that decided to stay, and the players that decided to go and what it means for their teams. Depending on how long that goes, I'll either take a break or I will jump right into my uh, top 25 for next year. I was going to call it my way too early top 25, but really at this point it's not a way too early top 25. With the NBA draft deadline here, it means that we basically know where all of these players are are playing major college basketball next year. Now, there's still, I don't know, two to three impact transfers that are available on the market. But for the most part, these rosters are set as many, 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 many players made their NBA draft decisions on Wednesday. So what I'm going to do now, the winners and losers, who decided to stay, who decided to go, obviously their schools will be winners or losers. And then from there, we will get into my updated top 25. The biggest winner of the week? Well, there is no doubt about it. It is the Gonzaga Bulldogs. And I know every time I say anything nice about Gonzaga, oh, Torres, they're overrated, they stink, they suck, they whatever. All I'll say is this. I, you know, listen. Last year, they beat UCLA, they beat Texas, they beat Texas Tech, they beat a lot of good teams in the regular season. Their conference was a three-bid league. Uh, they ran through the conference. They were the number one overall seed. I thought that they probably weren't the best team in college basketball, but they were still really good throughout last year. And here's the crazy part. There was a scenario coming into the week where Gonzaga could bring back zero starters from that team. Whatever you think about Gonzaga, they were the number one overall seed in the tournament. They could bring back zero starters. Well, on Tuesday, we found out that Rasier Bolton was going to return. I talked about him on Wednesday's show. But going into Wednesday, Rasier Bolton, by the way, 11 points per game. He transferred from Iowa State. Really good player in year one at Gonzaga. Had one year of eligibility left, tested the waters, and decided to return on Wednesday or, or Tuesday. Wednesday was the big day, though, for Gonzaga because they had two really important players that were still testing the draft waters as of the final day of the NBA draft deadline. The first one was Julian Strother, 11 points per game last year, kind of big 6'8", six, 6'9", six, forward, a guy that I really believe has a chance to break out should he return to college basketball next year, and of course, Drew Timmy, the All-American. Well, first decision came in, I don't know, about 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday, and drum roll please, and I promise I'm not going to do a drum roll for all the decisions, but Julian Strother, 6'8 forward, announces that he is returning. As I said, I think he has a chance to be a breakout guy. Gonzaga has these guys every single year that you don't know much about. You don't know anything about them. You saw them kind of play a game, and you kind of remember them from last year's tournament, and I think that guy was good. I can't really remember much about him. And then the next year, he's averaging 22 a game, and he's on NBA draft boards. I think Strother could be that guy. As I told you, I saw probably his best game of the season was against Duke in Vegas on Black Friday. He was phenomenal. I think with another year in the system, he has a chance to develop into an NBA player. The second one, though, was the big one. It was the big decision that we waited all day for. Obviously, the most high-profile player that was left in the NBA draft conversation going into Wednesday, and that was Drew Timmy, the two-time All-American, the leading scorer on the, the Final Four team two seasons ago, the leading scorer on this year's team, and he really took it down to the wire. Now, what I would say, I was thinking about this the, uh, as I was waiting for Drew Timmy. When I... I once interviewed Drew Timmy at a high school All-American camp, the Pangos All-American camp that I'm actually going to on the back end of this week. I can definitively tell you that there is not a single person, a single high school basketball player, and he was in high school at the time, that I have ever interviewed that was a tougher interview to get stuff out of than Drew Timmy. This was when he was being recruited by colleges. Obviously, he had not committed yet. And I remember asking him about like 15 different ways to get any information out of him. What schools are you considering? What coaches do you have the best relationship with? Um, it, do you want to stay close or go far away? 
and he just would not give you anything. And so why do I bring it up? It is because throughout the day on Wednesday, we're waiting for Drew Timmy, and I started to remember that conversation. And I remembered how he is not going to give any piece, any member of the media, any piece of information. And I kind of thought this is probably a good thing. It probably means that he is going to make the decision on his own time. And as the day went on, I really actually thought it was more likely than not that he was going to return to college. Some would say it felt more likely that he was going to leave. But I don't feel if, if you know you're leaving and you know what you mean to the Gonzaga community, uh, I, I get the sense that you're not going to waste everybody's time if you know you're leaving. Well, at about 11.20 uh, Pacific, 11.20 Eastern time, 8.20 Pacific, Drew Timmy did officially announce he is coming back. And so what I would say is, one, probably the most recognizable player in college basketball outside of maybe Oscar Shibwe, maybe Armando Baycott. Those two are probably the two that are in the short conversation. He is coming back, and with his return, with Julian Strother's return, with Rasir Bolton's return, I'm just going to say it. Gonzaga just got back three starters off of the number one team in the country throughout most of the year. I said it on Wednesday's show. It, there are going to have to be other guys that step up. They have two sophomore guards, Nolan Hickman and Hunter Salas. I think one of those guys has to make a real leap, a like All-American leap. And it is worth noting Hunter Salas is a former McDonald's All-American. And so it isn't inconceivable to me that that kid could do it. Nolan Hickman, former top 30, top 40 prospect, originally committed to Kentucky, ends up at Gonzaga. He could be that guy as well. I bring it up to say one of those guys is going to have to make a leap for Gonzaga to be a legitimate national championship champion contender. There is buzz, by the way, that they could add one of those impact players out of the transfer portal. Malachi Smith uh, from Chattanooga. The buzz is that he could be a Gonzaga Bulldog. But either way... Gonzaga, the single biggest winner at the NBA draft deadline. The second big winner, before we get to some losers, I'm a glasses half full guy. I don't like talking about losers, except for some of the guys I went to high school with. Don't really care about talking about them. But anyway, uh, biggest winner besides Gonzaga on Wednesday was, and I'm not going to do the drum roll every time, but we got to give a drum roll, please, to the Houston Cougars. Love me some Cougars, baby. The Houston Cougars, a big, big, big day for Houston as they get back their best player, Marcus Sasser. And I talked a lot about Marcus Sasser on Tuesday, on Wednesday's show. I talked a lot about him really in the lead up to the draft. He is one of the more interesting stories because if you remember, Houston, another great season. Houston makes the Elite Eight where they lose to Villanova. But the buzz about Houston was, can you believe how awesome they look? Can you believe how good they look? Because they lost their top two players to season-ending injuries. Marcus Sasser was one of them. Marcus Sasser was averaging 18 points per game and then went down in the middle of the season with a foot injury. Doesn't play. Houston still ends up in the Elite Eight. And the question was like, oh my God, can you imagine Houston bringing back all of their key guys plus adding the two guys that were hurt? The other guy was named Tremont Mark. And so the buzz all, 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 all uh, since the season ended was, imagine what Houston could look like next year. And then Marcus Sasser kind of under the radar declares for the NBA draft. He goes through the process, and he absolutely blows up. He absolutely blows up. He gets invited to the G League uh, Combine, which then leads to him getting invited to the main Combine. And there was buzz that he really played himself into consideration to be drafted pretty high. So the fact that Houston gets him back is a major, major, major win for Kelvin Sampson. And I just can't speak to how important this is for Houston. I'm going to drop my top 25 in a minute, but I think you are going to be genuinely stunned at where I have Houston in this top 25. I am a believer in this team, but it is because of Marcus Sasser. We know they're going to play defense. We know they're going to rebound. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how well you play defense, you need to put the ball in the basket. And I believe that Houston will be able to do that with Marcus Sasser. And in my opinion, outside of Gonzaga, Houston was the single biggest winner of the day. Can't be all winners. Glass can't be half full for everybody. And it's a little bit empty at Michigan right now. Michigan probably the single biggest loser of the day when it comes to the college basketball draft deadline. But I don't know that it's all that surprising. Now, they got great news at the deadline to enter the NBA draft, which was May 1st, when Hunter Dickinson, their star player, decided, you know what, I'm going to make some crazy NIL money, 
I'm a college basketball star. I'm going to stick around for another year. But they had two players declare, Caleb Houston, 6'7", 6'8", wing, um, averaged 10 points per game, about 35% three-point shooting, really struggled early, really came on late. And then Musa Diabite, a seven-foot freshman who was really kind of a counter to Hunter Dickinson, sort of played the same position but sort of didn't. Both finished their freshman years. Both entered as potential one and duns. Both didn't live up to their expectations. But at the end of the day, both decided to leave. And what I would say is a couple things. One, I don't think either one was surprising. We've talked about Caleb Houston on this show. We talked about the fact that he was invited to the NBA Draft Combine and was one of the few players that refused to play despite being invited. It led many people to believe that he probably had an NBA draft guarantee and did not need to play because somebody has promised to draft him in a spot that he is happy with. Musa Diabite, it's kind of the same thing. Um, a little bit different. He, if he had come back to Michigan, like I said, he kind of plays the same position as their star center, Hunter Dickinson. Didn't really feel like it made a ton of sense on paper. And so I don't know that either of these, these uh, the, uh, decisions are surprising at all. What I would say, though, it does make me think of one thing. At the deadline to declare, I talked a lot about how the new world of college basketball, it was encouraging these guys to elect to come back because of NIL opportunities. Armando Baycott's coming back at Carolina. Caleb Love is coming back at Carolina. Oscar Shibway is coming back at Kentucky. Hunter Dickinson's coming back at Michigan. But I do still think there is a segment of the basketball population that enters as a one and done sees their name on an NBA draft board, and when they get the opportunity to leave, they just can't help but leave, even if it probably makes sense to come back. I'm thinking of Caleb Houston in this situation. That is a kid to me. Average 10 points per game, 36% three-point shooting. If that kid comes back and he puts in the work, that is probably now an 18, 19 per point per game score and probably a top 10 to 12 pick at worst next year rather than now going being a late first round, early second round pick and having to grind through the G League. But some kids, they want to go pro. Some kids see themselves as a one and done. This kid feels like one of those. But with his loss, it drops Michigan pretty far. I considered removing them from the top 25 altogether. Because I think Hunter Dickinson is going to be one of the best players in college basketball, I kept them on the fringes. But outside of Hunter Dickinson, there's not much there. Juwan Howard's two kids, believe it or not, uh, believe it or not, uh, Juwan Howard's two kids will both play an impact. Uh, Jet Howard, who is uh, uh, going to be a freshman, and then Jace Howard, who has been there for a few years. They brought in a transfer point guard named Jalen Llewellyn from Princeton. But outside of Hunter Dickinson, there isn't that much there. Let's go back to the winners from Wednesday. And how about your boy Bill Self? Dollar Dollar Bill, y'all. Kansas Jayhawks. Really great day for Bill Self in Kansas. Now, it hasn't been a perfect spring for Kansas, but uh, you, know, you win a national championship and you know you're going to lose some guys. And so because of the extra COVID year, Ochai Abaji and David McCormick, basically their two most important players, could have come back. They were both seniors. Both decide to leave. Both probably should, to be perfectly honest. Ochai is going to be a top 20 pick. David McCormick, I believe, has already completed his master's in four years. Kid's way smarter than I am. No reason to come back. Earlier this week, they find out that they're losing Christian Brown, but that was kind of expected all along, so it's not all that surprising. But they came into the final 24 hours with two players that had yet to make a final decision on their future. One, a player that was on the team last year, Jalen Wilson, really good kind of stretch four, 10 points, seven and a half rebounds per game. Also, Kevin McCullough, remember, this is the kid that transferred from Texas Tech, really good player at Texas Tech, I thought was the most important player on their Sweet 16 team this past year. He enters the transfer portal. He commits to Kansas, but does not commit to returning to college basketball next this coming season. Says, if I do come back, that is where I'm going to go. Well, on Wednesday, we found out that both of those players will come back. And I'll tell you this, if you're sick of Kansas, if you're sick of Bill Self, well, sorry for you guys and girls, because that program ain't going nowhere. One, first of all, Bill Self's a great coach. I mean, Bill Self is a great coach, no matter what you think of him, no matter the FBI stuff, whatever, that dude can coach some ball, okay? 
Beyond that, they are now bringing back two starters with Dewan Harris and Kevin McCull or two starters with Dewan Harris and uh, the other guy I mentioned, Jalen Wilson. They're at, they're bringing in a couple key pieces via the transfer portal. Well, really, just one, the Kevin McCuller kid. But Kevin McCuller is like an All Big Twelve first team kind of guy if he can stay healthy. And then three McDonald's All-Americans on top of that. And I would add, too, they had some nice pieces off the bench that I think are going to play bigger roles. And really, why Bill Self is as good as he is, he's one of the best talent developers in all of college basketball. Bill Self, ultimately, um, because of the fact that he is such a good talent developer, I have faith in him that some other guys are going to step up. Uh, I'll discuss where they are in my top 10 in a minute. But Kansas and Bill Self, a big winner from Wednesday afternoon. Quickly, let's rip through a couple other losers and then we'll get to the updated top 25. One biggest loser outside of Michigan, I think it's Colorado State. And I forgot to mention Colorado State on Wednesday's episode, but Colorado State had a player, a very important player that was making a decision as it pertained to his future at the NBA draft deadline. His name was David Roddy, and if you didn't follow Colorado State closely this year, remember, Colorado State, they got an at-large berth. They were a sixth seed in the NCAA tournament. They actually lost to Michigan in the first round of the NCAA tournament, but they were a sixth seed. They won like 25, 26 games this year. Well, David Roddy was their best player. He was the Mountain West Player of the Year, 19.7.5 rebounds per game. One of the reasons that I never really talked about him was because I never really thought he was seriously considering going pro. If you watch him, he's a little bit shorter. He's about six foot five. He's kind of a low post player at six foot five. Um, you know, shot the three ball very well, but he just doesn't strike me as an NBA player. But throughout the process, you started to hear some buzz that maybe, just maybe, um, you know, this was a kid that was actually starting to, uh, to to pick up some draft buzz, and so now he elects to go pro. And this is just a crippling decision for Colorado State. I mean, obviously, look. We know Colorado State, you know, you don't have to know college basketball to know Colorado State just doesn't have a McDonald's All-American waiting in the wings. They don't just have a uh, difference-making transfer waiting in the wings. And had he returned, they were set to return their top four scores off of a team that, again, finished with about 25-26 wins and was a sixth seed in the NCAA tournament. Now they are, at best, the third-best team in the Mountain West. I think San Diego State and Wyoming, who we'll get into in a minute, uh, are both clearly ahead of them. Colorado State, probably not an NCAA tournament team. Colorado State would have been a fringe top 25 team without, with David Rowdy, excuse me, they now have to move on with life without him. A couple other losers, really quick one, you know, it's the Duke Blue Devils. I don't think this is a crippling loss for Duke because I never thought that he was coming back, but Trevor Keels, big 6'4 guard, decides at the last minute to declare for the draft, to stay in the draft. Fascinating story from this kid. You know, this was the kid that blew up had the great game against Kentucky in the season opener, finishes with 25 points, 10 of 18 from the field, and everyone's like, oh, this is the next great Duke player. And then he really wasn't all that good the rest of the season, 11.5 points per game, 2.7 assists per game. You know, listen, by, by the standard that we hold freshmen to, he was actually pretty good, but he certainly peaked in that first game. Down the stretch, there was increasing buzz that he might come back. Uh, And according to Jeff Goodman, there was some real consternation from him, uh, big dictionary word there, that he he could, in fact, uh, decide to go pro. Is he going to go pro? Should he return? He was really torn at the last minute, decides to go pro. Now, he's one where I can see one of two sides. One, I think in a perfect world, we all say, look, this is another kid. If he comes back for another year at Duke, he has a chance to be a real breakout superstar and a guy that plays himself into the top 10, top 15 of next year's NBA draft. And so now you're entering the draft. I don't think he is going to be a first-round pick, probably a second-rounder, and you're really going to have to work to find a spot in the NBA long-term. On the flip side, what I would say about that, you also have to remember this. Duke has the number one recruiting class coming in next year, and I kind of get the sense that that th- this has happened at a lot of these schools. It's happened at Kentucky. It's happened at Duke. I think it's starting to happen at Arkansas now, where the coaching staff kind of recruits the next class anticipating you leave, then you're kind of unsure, do I want to stay, do I want to go, what do I decide to do, all that good stuff, and the next guy's there. And so if you had come back to Duke, you're dealing with two, three guards in the number one ranked recruiting class, most notably Derek Whitehead, a projected lottery pick next year. Obviously, Jeremy Roach is going to have the ball in his hands, and it puts you in an impossible spot. 
So I don't know how crippling this is for Duke because I don't know if they really ever truly expected to get him back. It's also worth noting uh, there was a report uh, by Jeff Goodman again that Courtney Ramey, a transfer from Texas, is seriously considering Duke. So they may, may already have his replacement. But it is really interesting to think about Duke probably a little bit of a loser on decision day. Last one, and then we'll get to the updated top 25. Uh, really just a crushing loss. Marquette loses their best player, Justin Lewis. Um, and we didn't really talk a ton of Marquette on this show, but what I would say is that, that Marquette was really one of the pleasant surprises. Justin Lewis was by far their best player, 17 points per game, eight rebounds per game, 35% three-point shooting. Um, I don't know that this was all surpri all that surprising. Now, I, I, I have a little bit of insight into Justin Lewis's situation, don't want to get too much into it, um, but I think they're pretty confident with where he is going to be drafted. And so on the one hand, just a, a crushing loss for Marquette. I think they were kind of a fringe top 25 team if he decided to come back. But two, what I would also say is Shaka Smart, to his credit, really took a team that, that nobody expected to be any good and got them into the NCAA tournament last year. And so maybe Shaka really is at the right place at the right time where he can really take these kids that are, you know, basically just take a group that doesn't look good on paper and turn them into something. I don't know. But to me, Marquette is an unquestioned loser from the NBA draft deadline. Again, here are your big winners. Gonzaga, Kansas, Houston are your big winners. And your big losers from the NBA draft deadline, Michigan, Colorado State, uh, Duke, Marquette. I believe those were most of the big decisions. Forgive me if I missed one or two. But those are the big ones. Those are the big ones.